This video continues looking at properties of determinants and rules that can be used to simplify them. So the previous videos introduced the concepts of a determinant, but it was clear that these were rather tedious computations in general, and so we want some rules and shortcuts which allow us to simplify it. However, before we continue, just remind ourselves of the general definition for a determinant, which is the sum along any row or column of coefficients times the relevant cofactor. Every now and then that definition will come in useful. So a reminder of what we've done in video 12. We showed that for upper or lower triangular matrices the determinant is the product of the diagonal matrices, so that was quick. If a matrix has an entire row or column of zeros the determinant is zero, so that is quick. And what we showed in the previous video was that if we scale any row or column by lambda, then the determinant is scaled by lambda. And if we scale every element by lambda, the determinant is scaled by lambda to the n. And what we'll do in this video is we'll develop properties which identify when a determinant might be zero. Because if we can look at it and say straight away, hey, the determinant is zero, then we've saved ourselves a lot of computation. First rule then, if two rows or columns are identical, then the determinant must be zero. So we'll start by demonstrating this with a two by two example. You'll see here, the first row and the second row are the same. So if I calculate the determinant, what do I get? AB minus BA, which is clearly zero. So if both rows of a two by two are the same, the determinant is zero. Now, you could do the same if you made both columns equal, and hopefully you can do that by yourself. What happens then if we go to a 3 by 3? And again, I'll use rows, but you could equivalently do it with columns. You'll notice here I've said row 1 and row 2 are going to be the same. Now, what's interesting about this is if I now do the determinant definition along row 3, so I'm going to use the sum along row 3 of coefficients times cofactors, this is what I get. Coefficient a31 times the corresponding cofactor, coefficient a32 times the corresponding cofactor, and so on. But if you look at all these cofactors, what do you notice? They are all 2 by 2 matrices which have identical rows. <coughs> and therefore, all of these are zero, and therefore the overall determinant must be zero. So essentially we've exploited the results from two by two determinants, which is if a two by two determinant has common rows, the determinant is zero, and we've shown that using that result, we can say that if a three by three has common rows, the determinant is zero. Now an alternative proof could be shown here. Again, you'll see I've used rows 1 and 2. You could use any rows you like. But the key thing is, if you use one and 1 and 2 and you look at the cofactors, what do you notice about the cofactors for rows 1 and 2? They must be the same, but with a sign change. And that's obvious because, for example, if I cross out row 1 and find the cofactors, look at the matrix that you've got. Whereas if I cross out row 2 and work out the cofactors, you see you get the same minus in both cases. But the difference is the sign matrix gives you a minus for one and a plus for the others. Now, if I do an expansion okay, um, along row one or along row two to find the determinant, there's the expansion along row one, there's the expansion along row two, and you'll notice I've used the full cofactor name there. I said its cofactor should be A21, but what I've noticed next is that A21 equals minus A11, and A22 equals minus A, um, get it right, 1, 2, and so on. So if I make that substitution, I end up with this here. Now what's key about this statement down here is you'll see in essence it says that the determinant of A equals minus the determinant of A and so the only possible solution is that the determinant is zero. Now why I've done this proof here given we already did the proof on the previous video is you can see this gives an easy extension to 4 by 4, 5 by 5, 6 by 6 and so on because this generic approach will apply for all of them. 
So if two rows are the same, the determinant of a 4 by 4 is 0. And I'm not going to dwell on this. It's clear that every cofactor for the fourth row is made up of a 3 by 3 determinant, where the 3 by 3 determinant has common rows. So for example, if I do the cofactor for 4, 2 and cross there, you can see that that minor is made up with two common rows, and we've shown that the determinant for that is zero, and therefore we need to know more. Now, I've done common rows. Hopefully, extension to common columns is obvious. So here's an example. In this particular case, you can see I've got row one and row two are the same. And so what's the determinant? It's zero. Here's another example. And what have we got here? You can see we've got column two and column three are the same. And what's the determinant? It's zero. Now there's a corollary, and this is quite a useful corollary, which follows on from the previous video. If a row or column is a multiple of another row or column, then the determinant is also zero. So they don't have to be the same, they just have to be multiples one of another. Now this follows from the previous video where we showed that scaling any row by lambda or column results in a scaling of the determinant by lambda. So if I can choose a lambda to scale a row or column to make it exactly the same as another row or column, then clearly for the scaled matrix, the determinant is zero. Well, if the determinant of the scaled matrix is zero, then the determinant of the original matrix must have been zero as well. So here's an example. What can we see here? If you look at row 1, 1, 3, 4, and then look at row 2, what do you notice? Row 2 is twice row 1. And because row 2 is twice row 1, they're multiples of each other, the determinant is zero. Different example. What can you see? There's column 2 and there's column 3. And what do you notice? Column 3 is three times column 2. And because they're multiples of each other, the determinant is 0. Adding a multiple of any row to another row does not change the determinant. So this is quite an important rule, as you will see. So it builds on the two early results. If two rows are the same, the determinant is zero. And if I scale any row by lambda, it results in a scaling of the determinant by lambda. So I'm going to use those two rules to say that if I add a multiple of any row to another row, it does not change the column. And again, as ever, this would also apply to columns. So here's an example. You can see I've got a matrix A over here. And to get matrix B, I've added row 1 to row 2. So that's the only difference. You can see I've just added row 1 to row 2. And now I want to know what's the determinant of B. Well, I've just written out the formula in full here. Here's a formula for the determinant of A. And I've done the expansion along row 2, because that's where I've done the addition. And I've also done the same definition for the determinant of B. But you'll see the difference is that because the coefficients have changed, I've got a slightly different expression. I've got A21 plus A11 times cofactor A21, A22 plus A12 times cofactor A22, and so on. But you'll notice that these two expressions are quite similar, as you expect. And what's the key point? If you separate them out, you'll see that the determinant of B has got the determinant of A plus these extra terms, a11, a21, plus a12, a22, and so on. And now we can do a neat little trick. We can go backwards and say, what's the underlying determinant calculation that gives us this? So here we go. That's the expression we had from the previous page. So I'm going to say, can I represent this expression here as a determinant calculation, because it looks like a determinant calculation, where that's the determinant of matrix C. And the answer is, of course, I can. If you define matrix C like this, and you'll see I've put those coefficients on the second row, then you'll find it works out. Because the cofactors for C are the same as the cofactors for A taken along 
the second row. But here's the interesting point. If you look at C, what do you notice about the first and second rows? They're the same. And therefore, clearly, the determinant of C is 0. And therefore, that cancels. And what do you notice? Therefore, the determinant of B equals the determinant of A. So here's some examples. What have I done here? You'll see I've added row 1 to row 2. So there's A. And if I add row 1 to row 2, you'll see that all that's different in B is I've got a different row 2, which is the original row 1 plus the original row 2. But if I calculate the determinants of A and B, what do you notice? They are the same. So adding that row didn't change the determinant. Here's a different example. And what have I done here? I've added column 4 to column 3. So there's my new column 3, and all the other columns are unaffected. But when I do that, and I compare the determinant of A and the determinant of B, look, they are the same. Now, this just extends the result slightly by saying, what if I add a multiple of a row to another row? Is the same result going to apply? So you can see here, I've done lambda A11, lambda A12, lambda A13, lambda A14. Now, I can go through exactly the same analysis as on the previous um, slides. You'll see all that I've got now in these brackets is lambda. And I can again, I can re reduce this result to the determinant of A plus this new expression here. And this new expression is going to be the equivalent of lambda times a determinant expression C. And as before, that matrix C sorry, it's going to be the same one we did before, and so clearly the determinant of C will be zero. So the key point is I can add a multiple of a row to another row, and it doesn't change the determinant. An extension of columns is obvious. So here's an example. What have I done? I've added 0 0.4 times row 3 to row 2. So there was the original row 2. 1, 2, 8. And then if you multiply row 3 by 0 0.4, I'll write it down, you get 0 0.4, 0, and minus 1.2. So that's the multiple of row 3. And I've added that to, sorry, um, to which way have I done it? I think I've done 0 0.4 of row 2 and added it to row 3. I've got that back to front. Either way, you can see the calculation there. OK, so row 3 has become row 3 plus 0.4 times row 2. And what do you notice when you calculate the determinants before and after? They are the same. Here's a different example. What have we done here? We've subtracted 0.5 of column 3. There you can see. We've subtracted 0.5 of, of column 3 from column 1. That's the difference between A and B. But if you calculate the determinants of A and B, what do you notice? They are the same. So a couple of examples for us to do on pen and paper. Find the determinant using properties. And the key thing is to ask yourself, what properties do I know? Which ones can I use? And the thing to look at here is this. If you look at the first and second row, you'll find that the second row is minus 3 times the first row. So the rows are multiples of each other. That's the key thing. The rows are multiples of each other, and therefore the determinant of B must be 0. So you see, the whole point about learning these rules is you can get determinants very, very quickly, or often very quickly, with a minimal of computation. What about this example here? Now, this one's not quite so straightforward, and it looks really messy. but <coughs> Let's have a look at these two columns. 2 minus 10, 1 minus 5, minus 630. What do you notice about those? Well, those numbers are multiples of each other. So what I'm going to do is add 5 times column 2 to column 3. So if I do that, what's my matrix going to become? I get minus 1, 2, 3. 1, 5, minus 6, 
24 minus 4, 4, 2, minus 13, 9. So I've put in the bits that have not affected. And what I'm doing now is I'm going to say, what's going to happen to my new column 3? Well, if I add 5 times 2 to minus 10, I get 0. 5 times 1 to minus 5, I get 0. 5 times minus 6 to 30, I get 0. 5 times minus 4 to 21, I get 1. And so what do you notice now? That the determinant is equivalent to the determinant of minus 1, 2, 4, 3, 1, 2, 5, minus 6, minus 13. Now I need to worry about what the corresponding signs are. So this is in the position 4, 3, and therefore it has a negative sign. So we'll put the negative there. So your determinant has been reduced from a 4 by 4 to a 3 by 3 just by noticing that one column is almost a multiple of another column. At least in three elements it's the same. Now what can I do next? If you look here, you'll see 2, 1 and 4, 2. You'll see that they're nearly multiples of each other. So I can add, oh, so I subtract twice the second row from the first row. And so my determinant is now going to be equal to minus, and what we're going to get is minus 7, 0, 0, 3, 1, 2, 5, minus 6, minus 13. And now you see the determinant is getting easier and easier because now essentially I've reduced it to a single 2 by 2 determinant because the top row has got two zeros. So a summary. The top rules there are the ones we've done before and the new rules we've just added. If we add a multiple of any row to another row it does not change the determinant. If two rows or two columns are equal the determinant is zero and therefore if a multiple of a row or column is equal to another row or column the determinant is also zero. And we can exploit these rules to simplify our determinant calculations.